Hello, everyone. This is Zayami Eccles Erwin from FilmFestivalCircuit.com and the assistant director of the Austin Comedy Film Festival. Right now, we're gearing up for our fall 2023 screening, which is going to take place on October 12th at Central Machine Works in Austin, Texas. Uh, and today, we're talking with one of our participating filmmakers. Kieran Koshi is the director of The Last March of an Ad Creative. Kieran, thank you so much for meeting with me today. Uh, you're welcome. Pleasure to be here. Uh, so The Last March of an Ad Creative is... Uh, it's such a funny micro film and it has a message. I'm curious, what inspired you to make this movie? Um, we, we got the idea of sort of telling the truth about the business because we saw a lot of our friends um, sort of be discarded by the business in their prime, just when they needed, you know, stability and a future the mm. most. So it was, a, it was sort of a confluence of that and the fact that um, education to get into the business has gotten ridiculously expensive. And, it, you know, there is no sort of tenure for, uh, you know, uh, for the amount of money that you spend, you know, going to art school or whatever, or portfolio right. school to get into advertising. Um, so we felt we owed, you know, students and people co considering advertising as a profession, the truth about the business, um, because a lot of them get in thinking that this is something they can do forever. Uh, and they don't know that they're going to be aged out by the time they hit, you know, 48 or 50. Uh, and it is a harsh reality that nobody talks about. And we knew we couldn't be all doom and gloom. We had to sort of, um, you know, sort of frame that message in a comedic, albeit like dark, com right. <laughs> comedic sort of way. Um, so, yeah, we, we uh, a bunch of us worked on it and um, we wrote a script that we thought sort of, was entirely true, but we made it funny. Um, right. So yeah, I think that was that's what inspired it. It's it's just the need to tell the truth and let people know what it's like to work in advertising. Um, and I don't think anybody in the business will deny uh, that the 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 film is a hundred percent true. Uh, they hate it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> true. Right. Uh, but yeah, I, I feel like yeah, it was sort of like a we we owed the public, especially. Absolutely. Students, like we really do care a lot about young folk that get into the business. We want them to be prepared for it. So yeah, it was, that's what inspired it. Well, I love that. And I mean, it's such a great way to get the message across because the film hooks you in and it's so darkly comedic and you keep ramping up the absurdity of how this guy <laughs> is, uh, you know, going about, but the whole time uh, he's saying these things that, that ring true and they stick with you. I'm curious uh, uh, a little bit. What was it like actually shooting uh, those sequences? What was that process like? Um, to be honest, we didn't know if it was going to be funny when we had the script. It was funny in our heads, and we had very little money. I mean, we mm. shot and produced this entire thing for, I'm guessing, about $2,500. I mean, okay, well. um, so we, you know, called in every favor that we could. But all of it hinged on the actor. Um, and uh, we couldn't afford a casting session. So I sort of racked my head, you know, and I, I kept thinking of actors I'd worked with in the past. And this one guy, uh, Devin Bonney, came to mind. I'd used him for an HEB commercial that I shot in Texas, and I knew he was a Texas local. Um, and he's actually a barista in Austin. Oh, really? <laughs> so, so, you know, I sent him the script, and I told him, hey, dude, just read this in, like, your natural accent and read it in sort of like a, European accent too, because this message is sort of global and there's a right. lot of, you know, Europeans and Brazilians and Spanish, you know, creatives in the business who are very successful and could relate to it. So he tried it a couple of ways. And I remember I was, you know, waiting to pick my daughter up and, you know, you know, in the, I was in the carpool line and <laughs> uh, I got this uh, self take from Devin and it was hilarious. I mean, I, I couldn't stop laughing and I immediately sent it to my producer and I was like, dude, watch this. And he couldn't stop laughing. He called me right away. He said, look, I'm going to get this made for you uh, when you want to do it. So we just sort of put dates on the calendar and, um, you know, I, uh, I was able to get a location for free. It was, um, you know, it was a school. I can't mention which one that, uh, you know, hadn't really gotten back after COVID. So they had the facility already. In oh, okay. And I had some students from the school sort of be my PAs. So they got to watch the entire thing. 
uh, and the crew in Dallas uh, donated their time. So we had like a 10 person crew, um, you know, donate their time. And we had a DP who loved the script fly out from LA and he donated his time. So it was a message oh. that everybody knew was true and it resonated because they've all seen people sort of be sort of, sort of, you know, just discarded by the right. reason. So they all felt they had sort of skin in the game and they wanted to do something about it. So, yeah, that was the process. It was sort of magical. I never thought it would happen. I didn't know if it was going to be funny. Um, and, you know, for, for very logistical reasons, we needed a little person. And, you know, they were pretty hard to find, you know, actors who could, you know, carry it out. And we were lo- really fortunate to get Kenneth um, and you know, he, he wanted to do it. He saw the script and he totally relished the part. (laughs) It's a great part to to work the paddle. So it was, you know, it wasn't a lot of money, but he chose it over being, you know, in like a Santa thing for Christmas, you know, uh, you know, he's, he's an incredible actor. So we got really lucky. We had two, two amazing actors. And then um, the third person's lady with the blow dot, uh, is a friend of mine and uh, she lives in Dallas and I, t- I just told her hey do you want to be a part of this and she was like yes <laughs> sure and I just told her like, give me like a weird sort of big Texas hairdo and you know right have at it so yeah I mean it you know the process was you know it was it was yeah it was magical I I did not know what it was going to be like when we started out but yeah it, it just came together brilliantly well, I love that. And I, I feel like the big takeaway is if everyone believes in the project and wants this message, they're going to work hard and they're going to donate their time. And it seems like uh, it was a good shoot. I mean, and, and the, the result is so polished and, you know, there's nothing distracting you from getting at the core of, of what your actor is saying and what it's all about. Um, I'm curious, what did you learn from this process, though? Did you take away uh, any new insights, uh, you know, on the craft of filmmaking or getting a crew together or anything like that? Um. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've always sort of believed in sort of the magic of the process. And, um, y- you know, uh, like I'm typically very well prepped by the time we get to set. Uh, but this was a little, you know, a, a little sort of unpredictable because I'd seen the location, but the DP hadn't till he got there. So he wasn't really, you know, you know, he wasn't like 100% sure on, you know, what he needed. So, but we had all the stuff that he needed to light it. Uh, and we had like a hard time deadline. So uh, I wasn't worried about getting it all uh, in the, I think we had about six hours to do it. Um, it was just, I had no idea what crew was going to show up. I left it up to my producer and I'm sort of trusting that way. Uh, like when you work with really good people, you've got to let them do their thing, especially on projects like this where, you know, you have to trust the magic of the process. And I, you know, if it's a good vibe and set and, you know, everyone's doing what they're supposed to be doing, it'll come together. I mean, you know, don't sweat it. Um, And all of it was basically, you know, getting Devin's performance. I had him do it a couple of different ways initially. And once we had the the right one dialed in, and it's evident because, you know, the whole crew is laughing when, you know, (laughs) that's, you know, when it's correct. And I didn't really, you know, I didn't have a ton of um, like resources. I had a tiny monitor that I could, you know, watch him in, and I had right. to be able to. I had to stay out of the way because we were shooting. We couldn't rent an expensive camera. We borrowed like a Sony from someone. It was a small DSLR that we shot it on. Um, so yeah, it's it's like you know, not every job has all the resources, but you've got to make do with what you have, and you know, don't lose the the soul of the film. Uh, you know, you've got to you've got to preserve that. You know, all the extraneous stuff that you may or may not have. You know, you never know whether you're going to get it. Uh, but you know, as long as you keep the soul intact in the performance, I could. I mean, you know, we could have gone to a crappier location; it would have still been funny, right? You know, we could have kept a much simpler sort of camera move; it would still be funny. Uh, but I think that the, the entire thing hinged on Devin and Kenneth. Uh, and their their relationship and his delivery of the dialogue, right? I mean, <laughs> and his ability to climb in at the right moments because we didn't do it in one take. We it was it was a lot a lot for him to sort of memorize. Right. So we had to sort of pick out edit points, um, and you know he wasn't getting spanked for real, but he had to sort of feign it. Right. Um, you know it's it's all those little moments. Um, 
yeah, so <laughs> not a lot of time to rehearse. Uh, we just dove right in and fine-tuned and adjusted it as you went along. And yeah, I'm a big proponent of like just working with really good actors because they'll save your skin right? and the film. Uh, and if you have a bad actor, there's only so much you can do uh, before they get tired. You know, I mean, they all get tired. You can't expect them to work for like six hours in front of a camera right. break. I mean, you've got, to, you've got to know how much you can sort of ask of them. So yeah, I think that was learning those limits uh, is always a new thing. Uh, it's it's different with every shoot, so totally. yeah. I mean, I think uh, the and the walk and talk, you know, as a as a as a as a sort of idiom, has been done a lot, right? I mean, there's a lot of walk and talks, so this was challenging. I mean, it's another walk and talk, but we've got to be, you know, it's got to be fresh enough to stand out, and I think it did. Like, it definitely and, did. You know, Forbes magazine found it, you know, of all places, and wrote a whole article about oh, it. Oh, really? So, yeah, I mean. Excellent. Yeah, that was, uh, that was, you know, I just had a Google alert set up and like I get this email and like, you know, there's a whole article in Forbes, which is, you know, which is quite surprising. But yeah, it was gratifying. Uh, totally. A lot of people talked about it. And, and it's making its mark, which is, uh, you know, part of the goal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was, it was an exercise in like, you know, it was very cathartic because it's something a lot of people in the business that I've talked to, have, they've been wanting to get this out there. It's their way to vent about the industry. Totally. Um, uh, so it was very cathartic to get it out there. And it's one of the few pieces, I think it's the only one that I've ever done that I could watch over and over again. I would find myself just, you know, watching it in my car, listening to the mix on the car stereo. And uh, it was all unsupervised because, uh, you know, I just had to trust the people. Oh, Charlie Uniform Tango in Dallas did the mix and the car. Um, and, you know, I know those guys really well. And uh, Russell, who's the audio engineer there, did like a spectacular job. And the track was, you know, it was Needle Drop. You know, it's it's an old classic, uh, you know, piece of music. Um, and I thought it sort of fit the vibe perfectly. Right. Made it darker than a lot of people wanted it to be. But <laughs> that's one thing. Like, I was like, no, I think this is the track. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Well, I love that. That's very valuable insight there. Uh, I love hearing about the process, but I really uh, especially think the, the great takeaway is trust the magic of the process. If the vibe is right on set, if you've got a crew that you can you know put your faith in, it's going to work out. And uh, yeah, no, it, it's a great one. It's going to make a lasting impression when people see it. You know, I saw it. I'm, I'm still thinking about it. It's hilarious <laughs> and it's pointed. Uh, I'm curious, Kieran, what are you working on next? Do you have any more films in the works? Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, I've been wanting to do music videos for a while, so okay. uh, I, I met a very, like a, an unknown artist, and we've we've, we've filmed two, and uh, one's in the edit, and one's done. And I'm doing a third one for him because you know might as well do a trilogy when you've done two. So uh, I'm sort of going to start dabbling with AI for the third one, um, and then I've got a, a little documentary project about a. Uh, I'm a big believer in public education and public arts education. So my kids here in Long Beach went to a, a you know, a school that had this amazing violin program. So, uh, you know, everyone in second grade taught the violin, you know, the given violins to learn on. Wow. Um, and it's, it's, it's amazing. And it's been sort of spearheaded by two uh, musicians slash teachers who sort of do it after school hours. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just going to document that for the entire year, and hopefully, uh, that piece will become sort of like an uh, a, a little propaganda piece for arts education in public schools. And I know I used to live in Texas. I know that's not there a lot. Uh, right. You know, they've cut funding for a lot of public arts education, and you know, the simplicity of this program and the uh, effects of it will hopefully motivate you know school districts all over the country and that's the entire goal of it totally so yeah i mean that's it uh i've, I've got some scripts for shorts that we're still sort of tweaking don't know which one we're gonna make i mean it's got to i take a, i take a while to pick projects i mean it's it's got to sort of linger in my subconscious right uh for like six months or so and if i keep waking up thinking of it i know it's time to do it <laughs> it's like it's i don't system. jump and fall in love yeah i don't you know it takes a lot of time and money and effort uh, and a lot of people to right. sort of make anything. So you've got to really believe in it. You, you know. Um, totally. So yeah, 
I wasn't sure about the you know about the the ageism piece till like you know Adam, my producer, you know, called me back and he was he believed in it. So I was like, okay, I've got a few benchmark people if they believe in it. Right, you know, you know it's right. You know, it's right. It's a, you need your little critique panel. Totally. <laughs> Friends will tell you the truth. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's um, that's that's what I have going on. Um, there's, Excellent. You know, uh, there's constantly stuff that I you know, having a little notebook that I try to bring to life. So well, I like it. You have some good momentum with these other projects. That documentary sounds really fascinating. And yeah. uh, it's clear that you have um, a vision and kind of like a, a uniform thread, I think, uh, hearing about these different works uh, that goes through your creative output. So I am uh, pretty excited to see more from you in this documentary, Thank especially. You. I appreciate that. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to say about um, this ad piece? Last um, one the creative. No, I mean, just share it, you know, and if you know anyone who's thinking of getting into advertising, make sure they watch it. Make sure they watch that first. Yeah, because, uh, you know, uh, I, I used to teach and I used to teach at a, at a state school. So, you know, it was pretty, you know, it wasn't particularly expensive, but I know people have spent fortunes going to ad schools and yeah. art schools hoping they'd, you know, get into an agency and, you know, um, have a life. And they will. I mean, it's a great career, but, you know, uh, you know, a lot of them, you know, aren't told the truth by um, the institutions. You totally. Know? So I think they need to know it and they need to walk in with their, uh, you know, eyes wide open so that they make the right decisions, uh, you know, throughout their careers, you know, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to play this on October 12th at the Austin Comedy Film Festival. It made an impression on me, and I know it's going to make an impression on the crowd. And uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's just a great be, piece. Thank you. I'm ex really thrilled to be a part of it. So, excellent. Uh, yeah, thank you for having the piece. You know, absolutely. For yeah, appreciate. Well, it. thank you so much for talking with me, and I am going to uh, uh, keep my eye open for more work from you. All right. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Hopefully, I'll be productive. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.